Hi guys, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of The Walking Dead Season 7, Episode 4, Service. And this episode brought things home to Alexandria, and I cannot think of a worse nut check for Rick than taking all of his guns, burning the place he f***s on, and revealing that he is not the father. But this episode was surprisingly packed with little Easter eggs and interesting connections back to other episodes, so I'm gonna point out all the stuff you missed. And let's get started with the opening images. Now, one thing that surprised me about this episode was that it it totally skipped the immediate aftermath of Rick and the rest returning home, telling the others what happened. Instead, it jumps ahead a few days, and this opening shot tells us a lot about where the characters are now. So look at Rick and Michonne here. Last season, when we saw them waking up in a bed together, they were posed together in a loving embrace. Now, they are completely turned away from each other. Huge gap between them. It's like Jesus snuck in there in the middle of the night and was like, hey now, you two lovebirds, save room for Jesus. Yeah, no one is getting any action here. So this physical separation represents the emotional emotional distance between these two characters now, with Rick being forced into submission by Negan and Michonne wanting to fight. And we'll see how this change to their sex life, or lack thereof, takes a literal form at the end of the episode. Moving on to this shot of a Morse code alphabet on the wall. Now, I actually have a theory about why this could be important, which I'll get to when we get to that part of the episode, but for now, hang on to that thought. Now, I was actually surprised to see that Michonne still has her sword, considering she was definitely carrying it when the saviors captured her last season, and they confiscated Rick and everyone else's weapons, so you think one of those saviors would have been like, I want that. I will be a samurai. So my thinking is, is that Negan is okay with letting his subjugated people keep simple weapons like Rick's axe or the spears we saw at the hilltop and I guess Michonne's sword, but letting people keep guns requires more trust, like what they seem to have with the kingdom. Either way, I'm glad to see Michonne still with it because that sword is part of her personality. And I think that shot of the nails on the wall from when she hung it up in season five, hoping to never use it again, this shot is meant to remind us of how much the sword is a reflection of Michonne's fierceness and resolve and that she cannot part ways with it. I feel like Michonne should like name the sword the way Negan named Lucille. So what do we think? Uh, Governor Daughter Kebab? Eh, that's a bit of a mouthful. How about Michonne Nuff? And before I move on, it's also interesting to see Michonne practicing her sharpshooting with this sniper rifle. Now, if you read the comics, you probably noticed that Michonne is now kind of being adapted from the comic version of Andrea. Andrea is still alive at this point, and she's a tough advisor and romantic interest for Rick. And she's also the best sniper in the group. So if Michonne does go in that direction, this would bring that adaptation full circle. Okay, moving on. Now, I pointed this out before, but Negan's arrival with his silhouette on the gate as he knocks on it with Lucille, and then his line, Little pig, little pig. Big. Let me in. This is all taken directly from the comics, and it's such a cool, menacing moment that I'm really glad that they included in the show. But there's a few things I want to talk about with Negan's greeting. First, notice how much Spencer pisses him off by not knowing his name. Um, who are you? Oh, you better be joking. Now remember, Negan considers himself this god-like figure. He loves to put the fear of the Old Testament into his subjects, and not being recognized is like a huge blow to his ego. And the reason I bring this up is, notice how when Negan takes out this walker, he mentions the episode's title. What I just did? That is some service. Now, the word service carries some symbolic meaning in this episode. Like, it could just refer to a tennis serve, which is kind of what Negan does to this walker. <laughs> But for Negan, his idea of service connects to his God complex. Because in Christianity, service refers to the idea of the actions you take to actively express your faith. This can be through offerings like the collection plate, or by using your talents to do your part, just like how Eugene is assembling that radio. And I'm doing my part. Service actually comes up throughout the Bible, and it's reflected in this line from the Old Testament. Be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. And this is exactly how Negan sees himself, doing these great things for Rick and demanding Rick to fear and serve him. Now, I should say that I know I bring up religion a lot in these breakdowns, and that's not coming from me. I'm not trying to convert anyone. Hell Hydra. The Walking Dead show uses Christian symbolism all the time, with Bible quotes and Glenn's Christ imagery and Gabriel being a way bigger character on the show than in the comics. So if something on the show seems like it has a religious connection, it's probably intentional. Also, it's important to note that Negan is not God. This is just how he sees himself. He's an egomaniacal man with this huge superiority complex. And the way he does this unnecessary favor as a way to justify appreciation, it's actually a classic manipulative behavior psychologists have noticed in psychopaths. Like, I did this for you even though you didn't ask me to, so now you owe me. That's actually how I make all my friends. Wait a minute, all my friends are manipulating me. I'm a pawn. 
I'm a pawn. Before I move on from this scene, I want to talk about Daryl here. This is actually kind of cool. As the camera cuts back and forth between close-ups of him and Rick, check out Daryl's blinking. Now, a lot of people are saying that Daryl might be blinking in Morse code. And that could be why we saw that Morse code chart in Rick's living room. It would mean that Rick might understand Morse code and this could be a way they could secretly communicate. Now, I don't know Morse code, but anonymous experts online say they do. And this isn't confirmed, but they claim the blinking translates to riot if they kill me. Now, I don't know if I buy that. We don't actually see much of Daryl blinking across all the scenes this episode to get that many letters. And why would he want them to riot if he died? Like, he's not a martyr. Now, another online Morse code expert translated this as I East, which makes a little more sense because that could be the general direction of the sanctuary. So viewers, if any of you know Morse code, please confirm this for me and tell me what it's like to be a time traveler from 100 years ago or have a ton of free time on your hands. Okay, moving on to this shot of Negan after the credits where the camera weirdly zooms out. We almost never see this kind of shot in The Walking Dead. It feels kind of loose and almost comedic. And that's because it's the exact kind of on the fly camera movement used in documentary filmmaking. And it really became a common trope on shows like The Office and Parks and Rec. And with those Who's the Boss references last episode, Negan is really making The Walking Dead a lot more sitcom -y. Now, I mentioned in my last breakdown that we never see Negan separate from Lucille. And it's interesting how Negan proved me wrong this episode, making Rick hold Lucille. So why does he do this? On one level, it's about controlling Rick, forcing him to hold the weapon that killed his friends as a way to keep him in submission. But there's another creepier reason that connects to that idea of service that I'll come back to. Let's move on to Michonne trying to shoot this walker, but missing and hitting this deer instead. This is a cool callback to season two, when Rick, Shane, and Carl are hunting that deer, and then Carl gets shot suddenly when Otis shoots through the deer. There's a few reasons for this callback. Obviously, the episode wants to remind us of Shane and that idea of these characters' actions echoing moments from the past. But also, I think this deer getting shot is meant to connect us to Carl in that moment, specifically how Rick reacted, worried that he would lose his son. In the same way, I think this episode is designed to return Rick to that place of fear for his family. And speaking of callbacks to past episodes, check out the soda can that Negan pulls out of the cooler. That looks like an orange crush. In fact, I'm guessing it's the same can that Denise found for Tara right before she died last season. So Negan taking two sips from it and tossing it aside kind of suggests that Denise died in vain, which is super sad. Negan's even an asshole when he doesn't mean to be. But also, I think the show bringing back this orange crush is meant to remind us of that orange crush theory. Remember, that was the one that stated that Denise finding this can of orange crush and then shortly after dying in the same exact way that Abraham died in the comics was a clue that that orange would soon be crushed, which is exactly what happened. So it's really cool to see the show confirm the theory like this. I also liked how the show brought back those video camera recordings from season five. That was Rick at the peak of his badassery after he spent weeks as a drifter, killing everyone and turning himself into Grizzly Adams. And that version of Rick is meant to be a stark contrast to the soft, broken down man he is now. That's actually why we see Negan recording over the old Rick with this new version of Rick, basically erasing the tough guy that he used to be. And then Gabriel plays a really interesting role this episode. So first, notice how he scares Negan. Do you care to pay your respects? Holy crap! And yeah, sure, Negan's right. Gabriel is pretty creepy. But this points to the theory that I had that Negan being this false god figure. Just like the devil, Negan gets freaked out by a true man of faith. So why does he tell Negan that Maggie's dead? He even went as far to quickly dig an empty grave and then refill it the moment the saviors arrive, which is why Rick spots him wiping dirt off his pants later. So I think this shows some smart, quick thinking by Gabriel. When Negan arrived, Gabriel knew that Negan would wonder why that sick woman wasn't here now. And rather than send Negan off to the totally undefended and Hilltop, it would be easier to protect Maggie and her unborn baby if Negan thinks she's dead. Now, this seems like a smart plan until the saviors realize they've been lied to, so be careful, Gabriel. You might actually burn for this. Now, another character making a big gamble was Carl, and it's interesting how, just like Daryl punching Negan leading to Glenn's death, Carl's act of defiance leads directly to Negan making things way worse again, taking all the guns in Alexandria. And this reinforces Rick's fear of the consequences of rebelling against Negan. This is the second time Rick came 
came dangerously close to losing his son. Now, fast forwarding a bit through this episode to this scene in the church when Rick's trying to find out who has the two missing guns. Now, first off, hey, look, Enid made it out of that closet after all. Good for you, Enid. But also, check out how Rick is facing the same struggle of trying to convince his people to give up that real life war leaders have to do when they sign the terms of surrender at the end of a war. Like it's a separate battle to try to convince your people to agree to that defeat. In fact, notice how when Rick says, I'm not in charge anymore, Negan is. He walks backward. He's literally retreating as he admits defeat. Moving on to a few more callbacks later in this episode. Rick knows that Spencer has the guns because Spencer did the same thing last season, stealing from the pantry when he assumed no one else would notice, looking out for himself. Remember, Rick Grimes has that investigative police training, which makes it really easy to determine if someone is a gutless dumbass. Also, I love this callback with Enid in those green balloons. Now remember back in episode seven of last season, she and Glenn use those balloons as a way to signal the others. And then shortly after that, Glenn said this to her. People you love, they made you who you are, they're still part of you. So Enid is keeping these balloons as a way to remember Glenn. It's a small moment, but it's a really sweet way to show that she still thinks about him and she still remembers what he taught her. Okay, moving on. So last episode seemed to imply that Daryl still had some fight in him because he refused to say Negan's name. So why now has Daryl gone pretty much completely reek, saying nothing, refusing to take his motorcycle back or stay in Alexandria? Ooh, maybe his blood. Lincoln will tell us. Just Sternden Farpen. Oh, it's just gibberish. He's just blinking. What a surprise. For real though, I think Daryl might be playing a part here. He knows that if he can play by Negan's rules for right now, he might gain enough trust to officially join Negan's gang and then work as a kind of double agent for Rick and his people, which is kind of something that happens with another character in the comics. It's a little soon to tell, but we'll see. Then as Negan leaves, he tells Rick this messed up line, which the censors are surprisingly okay with. I just slid my dick down your throat and you thanked me for Ugh. Now, that's another moment taken directly from the comics, and it connects to that service theme that I brought up earlier. So this line, along with the image of Rick holding Lucille, it all has this gross sexual connotation to it. Like, Rick has spent this entire episode servicing Negan. See, not all interpretations of the show are pious and saintly. Some are super dirty. And then real quick, check out this missable detail when the Savior's vans drive over these two walkers. The wheel goes over one of their heads, crushing it. So why did the show go to the trouble for this effect. That's because Negan and the show wanted these two batted down walkers to mirror the two of Rick's friends that went down in the same way. And them lying there with their brains spread out on the ground is a clear reference to the image when Negan left Rick back in the season premiere. This is kind of like Negan's way of saying, never forget. It's also interesting how Rick looks at the sign outside these gates, vengeance for the plunderers. Now this could be read as ironic since Rick and his people were totally just plundered, doing nothing to defend themselves, or or you could read it as a foreshadowing promise. Like eventually Rick and his people will have their vengeance. But let's talk about this face off between Rick and Spencer. Now we know from the earlier scene that Spencer blames Rick for his parents' deaths, but Rick calling him weak triggers this hero complex inside of him. Austin Nichols actually said that he's been using Spencer's desire to be a leader like his mother was as a major inspiration for his character. But check out Rick's cold blooded response. You say anything like that again to me. I'll break your jaw, knock your teeth out. Now, I love this for a few reasons. One, Rick shows us that he can still be a tough, don't f with me badass when he needs to be. Also, when Rick forces Spencer to respond by saying yes, it shows how Negan's oppressive, threatening ruling style is starting to affect Rick. But here's my favorite part of this line. It's a callback way back to season two when Rick says almost the exact same thing to Shane. I wanted to break your jaw. Let you choke on your teeth. And that second reminder of Shane is in our mind in this immediate next scene when Rick drops this bomb on us about Shane and Judith. I know Judith isn't mine. What? I can't believe people are actually shocked by this. The show very heavily implied this back in season two, but I suppose it is a pretty big deal that Rick has known this this whole time. Now, Andrew Lincoln has said in interviews that it was important for Rick to bring this up right now because it reveals why he's afraid to fight Negan at this moment. He has this complicated relationship 
relationship with Judith, but he made the decision to raise her as his own. And that decision has made him particularly protective. He wants to see her grow up into this beautiful female John Bernthal. And then one day say to him, May I ask you something, Daddy? Why is Carl's hair longer than mine? But really, Michonne's argument with Rick is triggered by one thing in particular. They took their bed. So this has come full circle with the opening images. The metaphorical image of their emotional distance implied by their posture in bed has now become literal. They don't even have a mattress to have makeup sex on. And then the next scene adds insult to injury. The saviors didn't even want the mattresses. They just burned them and left them for the Alexandrians to find. So not only has Rick and Michonne's symbolic marriage bed, even though they aren't technically married, been stolen from them, that sense of safety and security that a bed represents has now been turned to ashes. But I should point out that burning the mattresses might not just be a f you from the saviors. Remember earlier in the episode, Dwight poured out Rosita's water, partly as a dick move, but also to make it hard for her to run off and escape, to make sure that she has to come back quickly. There's a practical reason behind it too. In the same way, I think burning the mattresses might have a practical purpose from the saviors. They don't want the people of Alexandria to be too comfortable and well rested in case a conflict arises. And it's that conflict that I think these mattresses mattresses are really all about because if you know classic films, this is a pretty clear reference to the famous line in The Godfather. You give him one message, I want some lots of matters all out war, we go to the Some of the other- Which means to prepare for war. And it's pretty clear in this moment that Michonne is ready to go nuclear. Which brings us to the closing images. So while Michonne emotionally readies for battle, Rosita takes a more active step to do her part. She finds that bullet casing from Negan's gun earlier in the episode and asks Eugene to make a bullet for the empty gun that she found on the walker. Now, some people are pointing out that Negan's Desert Eagle is a 357 Magnum, while Rosita's new gun is a 9mm, and whatever bullet Eugene made from that casing wouldn't totally fit Rosita's, but others online are saying with a little modification, a 357 bullet could fit a 9mm. The point is, apparently a lot of gun enthusiasts love the show. And for all those people, an episode about a new authority figure actually taking everyone's guns must have been the scariest Walking Dead episode yet. But the way Rosita challenges Eugene here, she's clearly finishing the conversation they had earlier about whether Eugene was doing his part. And this all connects to that idea of service that I've been talking about. Because service isn't just a word used for God-fearing people making offerings or sexual connotations. There's another type of service being implied here, military service. Rosita is recruiting Eugene for a new war effort. And hopefully with a new supply of ammunition, the people of Alexandria may be able to answer Negan with a new kind of service. Okay, some lingering questions. One, what do you think about the reveal that Shane is Judith's father? Personally, I don't know if I needed it, but I'm glad the show did it this way, rather than have Rick somehow not know, and it's this big reveal later on. Like having Rick know all this time makes him smarter, but also a better person for loving Judith all the same. And two, do you think it was a good idea for Gabriel to lie to Negan about Maggie? Like I get why he wants to protect Maggie, but I just don't really see Negan do anything bad to a pregnant woman. But if the saviors ever find out, which based on the promos for next episode, Go-Getters, where they go to the hilltop and Maggie's there, realizing he's been lied to could be something that triggers Negan to take some kind of sick punishment. I don't know, we'll see if this gamble pays off. Okay, thanks for watching and let me know what you think in the comments. And check out my breakdowns for the first three episodes of the season as well. And please hit like and subscribe to New Rockstars and share this video with all your Walking Dead friends. You can also contribute to us on Patreon. So thanks so much to all of our current donors, especially Pony Stark. Thanks, Pony! And if you are currently a patron, we'd love to have your support. You can follow me on Twitter at EA Voss with any questions or thoughts you had on Walking Dead, or you can follow New Rockstars on Twitter at New Rockstars. Okay, thanks for watching. Bye.